it's time, and I am the chair, so I want to go ahead and uh, call the session to order. Um, I'm really excited to be here with this group of exceptional scholars on a panel that I think is going to be really, really interesting. The title of the panel is Legacies of the Reagan Era, Memory, Economics, and Politics. Um, and so today, these four scholars are going to grapple with Ronald Reagan's legacy. Um, I'm going to take a pretty hands-off approach. I'm going to introduce each one of the panelists, give a brief bio, uh, invite them to come up and speak. And then uh, when they're done, I'll come back up, introduce the next panelist. Uh, they'll come up and speak. Uh, I'll have a few questions for the panelists, and then I will open it up for questions. Hopefully, we have a lot of time uh, for Q&A. Um, so with that, let me just go ahead and um, introduce myself. My name is Marcus Witcher. Um, I'm an assistant professor of history at Huntington College. Uh, my book is titled Getting Right with Reagan, uh, The Struggle for True Conservatism, which looks at the legacies uh, of the Reagan era. So I am super excited to see this new research um, by this panel. Our first speaker today is uh, Kenneth J. Heineman, a professor of history and global security studies at Angeles State University. Um, he's the author of seven books, most recently, The Reagan Revolution in 2021, uh, and The Rise of Contemporary Conservatism in the United States 2018. He is currently writing Bourbon, Cigars, and a Bucket of Warm Spit. <laughs> I had to make sure to get that right. Cactus Jack Gardner and the Rise of Texas Political Power. He teaches courses in Cold War Studies, International Relations Theory, U.S. Urban History, and Dictatorship and Democracy in the 20th Century. Ken. Well, thank you. I'll squeeze in here. Can you all hear me? I, I hate podiums. Um, I do want to open with how much uh, I, I'm excited to be here because I'm thinking almost 40 years ago, in 1984, I was a beginning graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh in history. It was the 84 election. There was excitement in the air. And I got to tell you, I was on the far right of all of the other graduate students and all but one history department faculty member. Yes, I voted for Walter Mondale. <laughs> And I'm afraid I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I corresponded with Bert, uh, Bert Folsom, and he can verify that one. He's another Pitt alum. Um, I'm not going to read my paper. Uh, I am going to spare you this. But I am going to try to um, go over a few notes I had taken. And I will make sure that I am definitely on time. I am a historian, thus I am an anachronism by definition. So I will have it out here. Now, of course, uh, the title of my presentation is directly lifted from uh, uh, William Luchtenberg in the shadow of FDR. And of course, you know, quite, if you've it's a great book, but Luchtenberg's story is, you know, he's interviewing all these living presidents because he has access. And it's like, uh, you know, when he talks to Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, it's like they're, they're relating the, the, the recounting as if they, you know, um, Roosevelt was like an abusive, mentally scarring stepfather. But Reagan was like, oh, Roosevelt, what a great guy, inspiration. And of course, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan did vote for Roosevelt all four times. Reagan hosted a 100th birthday party for Roosevelt in the White House in 1982. He finally recalled 1936, the campaign when Roosevelt toured Des Moines, Iowa. Reagan always expressed his gratitude toward the, uh, to the WPA, to the Works Progress Administration, during the New Deal, which saved his uh, father, Jack Reagan, from, um, well, ruin in the entire family, that he provided work relief, not welfare, but relief through work, to so his father could maintain his dignity. Reagan made the distinction between the New Deal and the Great Society of the 1960s. And he was more than anyone quite conscious of the fact that um, it was Roosevelt who, quote, said, you know, welfare is a narcotic. It saps the human spirit. But there's a difference with what Roosevelt was trying to do. Reagan um, can be credited with helping to salvage the finances of Social Security, you know, the key kind of keystone of the Roosevelt domestic policy legacy. Both um, were consequential presidents. 
Roosevelt was recognized as such almost immediately upon his death. It uh, took a while for Ronald Reagan, probably about 2016, before uh, his reputation had finally um, turned around some. While there are important uh, similarities between Roosevelt and Reagan, the differences are just as important. And I'll start with similarities and then go into differences. And again, very generally speaking here. Both Roosevelt and Reagan were underestimated and dismissed. Even the fact that they were governors of major states, uh, New York and California, that was all set aside. It did not matter the gubernatorial service. They were both unfit for the presidency. Uh, for Roosevelt, well, President Herbert Hoover wanted Roosevelt to run against him. He did not want Al Smith. He did not want uh, the possibility of a rematch. Roosevelt was a lightweight, this is the guy I can beat under any situation, no matter how bad the economy is with the Great Depression. And, of course, nationally syndicated columnist Walter Lippmann uh, was notably patronizing, like, he's a nice kid, essentially, but really nothing to recommend himself to, any value whatsoever. Now, with Reagan, of course, quite famously, uh, in 1981, Democratic House Speaker Tip O'Neill telling Reagan, you know, you were in the Bush Leagues, the minor leagues in California. You're in the major leagues now, you know, and you're in over your head. You know, just, just wait for the next election when we kick you out. And, of course, who can forget uh, Democratic um, wise man Clark Clifford in 1981 um, dismissing Reagan as an amiable dunce. Now, both Reagan and... Uh, Roosevelt are going to have internal party opposition. Now, with Roosevelt, of course, it was the 1928 Democratic presidential nominee, Al Smith, former governor of New York. Smith, although was considered, you know, kind of like the harbinger of this new mobilization of urban Catholic working class voters, Smith himself was ideologically very much a aligned with kind of the limited government Democrat. And even in 1932, Al Smith sort of had the sense that if Roosevelt wins the nomination, if Roosevelt is elected, the Al Smith kind of limited government Democrat was going to be, well, disappear, which it did. He's quite correct on that. Now, for Reagan, for Reagan, of course, it was the Gerald Ford White House and uh, the internal polling. It's really cool to see what's going on in the Ford White House when the polls are not releasing. And what you see from going into the 1976 uh, Republican primaries is a total meltdown. These are not real Republicans voting. Where the primaries are open to non-Republicans, we're getting these people who are not us who don't belong in the Republican Party. And, you know, these working class people, these Catholics, um, these are not our country club members here. And, of course, um, it was California Assemblyman Pete Wilson. Yeah, you recognize that name? It was Pete Wilson who wrote to Ford. You know, Reagan, Governor Reagan was a fraud. He did nothing for welfare, nothing in the state of California. He's a liar. He's unworthy to be president. This is just a total loser, and we must defeat him. And then, well, more famously, of course, John Anderson, House member from Illinois, challenging in the 1980 Republican primaries and losing, then going to a third-party challenge. But here's the thing. Yes, John Anderson got less than 7 percent of the vote nationally, but it's the demographics of his vote that often gets overlooked. You see, we always talk about Reagan Democrats. We don't talk enough about John Anderson Republicans. So Anderson did well, like 21 percent of the vote in high-tech communities, affluent upper-middle class communities, white college-educated the affluent suburbs, the Philadelphia, you know, mainline Philadelphia suburbs, that's where Anderson did quite well. And if you want to put a face on what I'm calling a John Anderson Republican, let me tell you about Jennifer Granholm. Uh, Granholm was a Gerald Ford supporter. She worked on the John Anderson campaign in uh, 1980. 
She's a graduate of uh, Berkeley and Harvard, Harvard Law. And, you know, as she argued, Reagan is a liar. All these lies coming out during the 1980 campaign. And the thing is, the American people are buying it. And as Granholm concluded, when Amer Americans listen to these lies, Americans become the key threat to America. Uh, Granholm, of course, will go on to become the Democratic governor of Michigan and Joe Biden's secretary of energy. That is your John Anderson Republican. And I will be coming back to that. Um, she objected to Southern white Protestants. She objected to the kind of lower income, working class union people. She's going to be one of the migrants into the Democratic Party that I'll be talking about. Okay, well, you know, both Reagan and Roosevelt were actors. Reagan most obviously, but we seem to forget a few things about Franklin Roosevelt. When Roosevelt was stricken with polio in 1921, he is paralyzed. He cannot walk or stand without the use of uh, braces locked into place. But what happens is he learns to be prepositioned at the podium before audiences arrive. He's locked into place. And Roosevelt learned how to use hand gestures, use tilt his head. He learned how to give the illusion of motion. And he does it quite well. And most Americans would have, have no clue the extent of Roosevelt's paralysis because he's so good at projecting the strength. And of course, that leads me then to communication. Both use ma the mass communication of their eras uh, quite well, radio and then television to great effect. But it's also a necessity for Roosevelt. Now, the thing with Roosevelt is it's not just that being paralyzed, that the radio is a natural ally to him. It's the fact that Roosevelt correctly estimated that 85% of the newspapers published in the United States were Republican and hated him and hated the New Deal. And Roosevelt needed to get around the media filters. And he is successful at that. And Roosevelt will have an impact also on popular culture. Uh, one of my favorite Roosevelt cartoons, of course, is Oswald the Rabbit. Have you ever seen Confidence when uh, Oswald the Rabbit is running away from the Great Depression, this looming threat, and Oswald the Rabbit is totally losing it. He runs into the Oval Office. Franklin Roosevelt jumps up from behind his desk, which he could not do, and he and Oswald Rabbit start dancing around the Oval Office and then march out to lick that old depression. Now, of course, Reagan will manage to enter film plot lines, whether it's Back to the Future, the Rambo franchise. He quotes from them. He's featured in them. He's the punchline, just as Roosevelt became one. Now, there's also kind of the issue of intelligence. It was um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who observed of Franklin Roosevelt, you know, second-rate intellect, but first-rate temperament. It's basically what we would now call social intelligence. The ability to, if you're a friend of um, young Sheldon, uh, you see that with Missy. I, I know it's kind of trivial, but she, that's social intelligence. The ability to read people, to understand a situation and see beyond the surface. And it's what H.W. Brands um, said with Reagan and Roosevelt, they were intuitive presidents. They knew how to see a situation. Now, um, there's this great um, document in uh, Thomas uh, Corcoran's uh, papers in the Library of Congress, Tommy the Cork, who came into Washington in 1932 to work for Jesse Jones of Houston for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And Corcoran became the great-grandfather of the K Street lobbyist, the political fixer. And... Uh, Night, about 1937, Lin, young uh, Congressman Lyndon Johnson is complaining to Coker, and it's like, <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere with Roosevelt. I got my five minutes, and I got nothing. And Coker says, Lyndon, Roosevelt has a limited attention span. Pictures. Roosevelt likes pictures. Bring pictures the next time. That's how you get to him. <laughs> 
Now, neither Roosevelt nor Reagan were really ideologues, most generally. Uh, Reagan, you know, famously said, you know, the hardline conservatives expect me to have flags flying as I go off the cliff. You know, I'm, I'm I, you know, you don't compromise. You know, that's what Buckley wants. That's what the hardcore conservatives want. And Roosevelt, it, I think, is too often forgotten, especially among conservatives. Roosevelt, at least especially in that first term, is not an ideologue. Leave aside 1936 and the re-election campaign. Leave aside the publicity. And let me tell you a telling anecdote. And it's during the 36 re-election campaign. And John L. Lewis of the CIO shows up at the White House with a check for $250,000, which he's waving in front of Roosevelt for the re-election. He emptied out the, the Treasury for the United Mine Workers Union. All right, he emptied it out in Pittsburgh, brought $250,000 with him. And uh, he's, it's like, here. And Roosevelt says, oh, no, John, um, I, I don't want to take that. But you know, there might be small needs arising later, and I'll come to you then. And of course, uh, Lewis is leaving the White House with his assistant, and his assistant's going, oh, thank God he didn't take it. You know, that's our whole treasury. And Lewis says, you don't understand politicians. They like to get under that honey barrel and like suck every drip of it dry. It's going to cost us more than $250,000, and we're not going to have the impact of one big check. He's going to take us for every penny a nickel at a time. Which he did. Um, Lewis ended. Uh, he did. Uh, that two hundred fifty thousand became two and a half million dollars. Yeah, multiply that by fifteen times. If you want to figure current dollar value of that little aid, and of course Lewis doesn't get anything really for that because it's little mounts at a time. That's Roosevelt. He knew how to work someone really well, and of course. Reagan and Roosevelt both shared priorities, and they're quite similar. Economic recovery is job number one, dealing with the prospect of global war. And all other issues rank pretty much far below those two concerns. Um, Roosevelt was not an activist on behalf of organized labor. He's going to get stuck with it because he needs them, but he's not there if he can avoid it. Just as, um, and certainly Roosevelt was not um, an activist on behalf of civil rights. Reagan, of course, with social issues, he gave tremendous rhetorical support for efforts against abortion and the like. But the moral majority and others, um, you know, in my paper, I, I see a lot of parallels between Jerry Falwell and John L. Lewis. Uh, they both got pretty much the same deal when you think about it. But the differences between the two, Reagan and Roosevelt, I think are considerable and must not be forgotten. And let me begin with vice presidents. Roosevelt had John Nance Garner, Cactus Jack of Uvalde, Texas. Now, you may not be all that familiar with him. I know this is political geekdom. John Nance Garner came to the House, the U.S. House in 1902 He'll end up on the House Ways and Means Committee. He helped to write the legislation to establish the federal income tax and the Federal Reserve before World War I. He and his uh, Republican buddy, Nick Longworth, son-in-law Teddy Roosevelt, were the two who established their own little bourbon poker club called the Bureau of Education, or Board of Education. And that's where they decided this is where stuff gets done. It's not on House debate floor, you know, on the floor debating. It's behind the doors, you know, after the business operation. Garner went on to become House Minority Leader and then, you know, U.S. Speaker of the House in 1931. And Garner built a political machine. Uh, his um, students, his lieutenants, were Sam Rayburn. That name might be a little bit more familiar than John Nance Garner. Uh, Hatton Summers, who will become chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Marvin Jones, who became chair of the Agricultural Committee. It's a whole bunch of Texans. And uh, Garner was also very close to Jesse Jones of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. 
Uh, it was Roosevelt who observed um, of Garner that Texans are running the government of the United States more than any other state in this country. And it's true. Even Tommy the Court Corcoran came in through the Texans and learned how to speak the language and do the barbecue. When Garner agreed to become vice president in 1932, he's the one who said, well, you know, the, uh, the, the vice presidency is not worth a bucket of warm spit. He actually said piss. But the media of that era wouldn't quote him. It, it really aggravated him. It's like, the only time I don't mind being quoted and you do that to me. And, um, oh. all right, sorry, wow. I'm just too long-winded. Uh, 25 of the House members who moved on to the Senate had all served under Garner, okay? His buddies in the Senate included Harry Truman, Joe Guffey, Lou Schwellenbach. He's a power. And a lot of the first New Deal is because of Garner's connections. George Herbert Walker Bush is quite different. Um, the guy was a product, um, he served a couple of terms in Congress, but he's a product of the executive branch. He's an administrative state guy, to use that term, which I know is not in favor. Um, but that takes us to kind of where the electoral coalitions are, and this is probably where I'm going to end up having to conclude. Reagan made inroads among working class Catholics, Southern white Protestants, but not entirely. He made the inroads, but did not bring about a realignment. Part of it is a lot of working class people did not do well during uh, deindustrialization in the 1980s. Inflation was destroying the middle class, and it hurts the working class, but inflation is heavily middle class. Roosevelt is a working class coalition with working class issues with the Great Depression. And so Reagan can be personally popular, but everybody's splitting their votes. These Reagan Democrats are voting down ticket for their local Democratic representatives. There is a slow motion realignment in the 1990s after Reagan's presidency, when after 1994, the fastest growing Republican block of voters were those earning less than $40,000 a year. But the fastest growing block of Republicans of Republican voters in the 1990s were those earning over $200,000 a year. This is part of that Jennifer Granholm or the John Anderson Republican thing. It's why in the 2022 midterm elections, the Republicans couldn't carry the Philadelphia suburbs. That's why you have Fetterman in the U.S. Senate. It's all Philadelphia suburbs, and that's what George Bush was being on the ticket for was to try to bring back, reel back in these John Anderson people. And, well, it didn't really fail. Now, let me just briefly point out something, though, a, a difference in terms of the media. Reagan had a hostile media like Roosevelt, but here's the thing. The rank-and-file journalists are much friendlier to Roosevelt, even the National Press Corps. There were 35,000 photographs of Roosevelt taken. Two showed him in a wheelchair. Yeah. Can you imagine that? So my concluding point, and I'm sorry I've taken up too much time, I think Roosevelt looks really good from afar, but if you look at him up close, he had it made. He's got a Great Depression. He's got an electoral coalition. He has the House. He has the Senate. He's got John Nance Garner as vice president. You can't lose unless, you know, you do an unforced error, like, you know, pack the Supreme Court, um, have organized labor blow up in 1937 in your face, and then in 1938 try to purge the Democratic Party of, well, you know, John Nance Garner and all those conservatives. Reagan looks better, I think, closer up, because what does he have going for him? He doesn't have the House. He's got bull weevils, as they were called. He barely has the Senate. And yet, Reagan accomplished a good chunk of his domestic policy agenda. I have to show a lot of respect for that. And that's where I'll conclude, and I appreciate your indulgence.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken, for kicking us off. Um, our next paper is by Brian Dimitrovic. It's titled The Legacy of the Reagan Tax Cuts on Business Models. Um, Brian Dimitrovic is the Richard Strong Scholar at the Laffer Center. He earned his PhD in history from Harvard University. He specializes in economic history and is the author of numerous books, including Econoclasts, The Rebels Who Sparked the Supply Side Revolution and Restored American Prosperity. His most recent book, co-authored with Arthur Laffer and Jean Sinquefield, is titled Taxes Have Consequences and Income Tax History of the United States. Brian? Thank you, Marcus. It's uh, great to be here at the conference. Arthur Laffer sends his regards. I work with him in Nashville, Tennessee, and I, at his center. And I should point out uh, that we've been doing uh, quite a bit, a bit of collecting of historical archives. So uh, those who are interested in the supply side revolution and the Reagan revolution and tax policy, uh, we're, we're, we're building up a, a reservoir of sources uh, with respect to the supply side revolution, including uh, those of Alan Reynolds, who uh, was co-coiner of the term supply side economics, Arthur Laffer himself, and others. So uh, it's the nerve center of the supply side revolution in the 2020s. It remains that, the Laffer Center. So if anyone's interested in that topic among the Reagan scholars, be sure to keep in touch. Uh, we will you know, welcome all researchers uh, at, at our center in Nashville. I would like to talk today about uh, the central uh, legislative achievement of the Reagan presidency, which is, of course, the, uh, the tax cut of 1981 and the follow-up of 1986, um, the great reduction in particularly personal income tax rates that happened over that period of time. And I would like to contradistinguish that with what happened in the employment market in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, there was a tremendous paradox in the employment market from 1980 to 2000. As you may be aware, uh, the first thing is that there was tremendous job growth. Uh, jobs in the United States increased by 38 million from 1980 to 2000, and that was uh, pretty steady. Went from about, just roughly speaking, 90 million jobs in the United States to 130 million jobs. So 90 million in 1980, uh, 40 million more in 2000 uh, at 130, and the rate of increase from 1982 uh, to 2000 was, was pretty even. So Reagan added about, about 18 million new jobs, and Bill Clinton uh, added about uh, 20 million new jobs with some flatness in the, in the early 90s. So there was just simply tremendous job growth. 40% uh, job growth over two decades is uh, a remarkable number. Uh, so that's one leg of the paradox. Uh, the other leg of the paradox is that there were tremendous layoffs in particularly the first period, part of this uh, period in the Reagan era. There were tremendous layoffs as there was an increase in 18 million new jobs. And that's the fundamental paradox of the employment market of the Reagan years. Mass layoffs, huge employment growth. The question is, well, how, number one, do you square that? And number two, what does that mean? And what was the mechanism of that transformation? Um, about the layoffs, that's my uh, main concern in this paper. Um, I think there is a key to understanding this major dynamic in the employment market in the Reagan years, and that is the fundamental transformation in the mathematical ratios of the tax code at the hands of the great pieces of Reagan's tax legislation. And I think um, we don't, as historians, need to consult archives for this. I think we can actually do this by inductive reasoning uh, by simply looking at the mathematical ratios and see what it must mean for the employment market. And then we can kind of look at that mathematics and then see what the, what the sources are telling us in an empirical sense. And what do I mean by these mathematical ratios? Well, I have it up here, if you can see it, but we can describe them uh, just the same if you can't. Um, let me just give you, again, some more vignettes about what was going on in the employment market, okay, about the layoffs. The layoffs were absolutely legendary in the early 1980s. I mean, the 1981-1982 recession still does not get its due uh, in terms of its severity and uh, the privation that it resulted in in many cases. I mean, I still say um, that this stuff about the worst recession since the Great Depression that we hear about so much with respect to 2008, 2009, um, really does us a disservice in historical understanding of what was going on in 1981, 82. I mean, there are very good um, testaments of, uh, I won't say starvation, like in the Great Depression. We have numerous reports of that in the New York City public school system. And as David Kennedy told us, 
uh, in his book on the Roosevelt administration, but something close to it. I mean, there's a lot of free, free food handouts, uh, long lines for them, too, in places like Homestead, Pennsylvania, um, where the steel mills were closing in 1981-82. Uh, just so from st some statistics, uh, W.R. Grace Company, the venerable shipping uh, conglomerate, owner of the Del Taco uh, food, <laughs> fast food chain uh, here in Southern California, but mainly known as a chemical and shipping conglomerate, uh, laid off 60,000 people in the Reagan era, and their employment force went from 80,000 to 20,000. Motorola, um, you know, had big 1990s with the cell phone when they, when they started to uh, focus on that, were, was laying off 10,000 workers a year in the Reagan years, 1985. And this is when GDP growth is over 4% per year. I mean, GDP growth was 12% in 18 months at an annual rate, 1983-84. Motorola is laying off 10,000 people. Honeywell, same thing. I'm doing it with some of our assistants at the Laffer Center, a big study of the Fortune 500 layoffs. Because if you look at the Fortune 500 membership, S&P 500 membership in 1980, I mean, they just shed all their employees in the 1980s and 1990s. And yet there are 40 million new jobs. And well, they must be Mick jobs, right? They must be hamburger flippers. That was the epithet in the 1980s. They were hamburger flippers. But uh, there was a 95% increase in real GDP growth from 1980 to 1990, so it is technically, it is mathematically impossible that they were Mick jobs. They must have been good jobs because you can't double the size of your economy with lousy jobs. So what's going on here with the employment paradox? Um, okay, I have uh, put up here on, the, on the, uh, the graph a flip, the reverse, the inverse, of what Reagan did with the tax code uh, with respect to the major rates. So as you may know, I'll walk you through it, um, what happened in the major pieces of Reagan's tax legislation, tax cut legislation of 1981 and 1986, uh, was that the rates of the income tax were radically lowered. And I'm particularly interested in the top rates, and we have to be interested in the top rate uh, for lots of reasons. Arthur Laffer and Gene Sinkful and I talk a lot about this in our book on the history of the income tax that came out last year. Uh, but the top rate is, is most important because we have a progressive system. If we didn't have a progressive system, the top rate wouldn't be so important. But if you have rates that keep going up with income, then cutting the top rate is going to have a much more, a higher mathematical effect than cutting a lower rate. And we can, we'll see that here in a second. And that's not to mention that the people who are affected by the top rate are the most economically competent by definition because they're making the most money. So they will be the most responsive uh, necessarily to the changes in the top rate. Okay, so what happened to the top rate in the 80s is it went from 70, that was 70, so 100 minus 30 was the top rate of the income tax in 1980, had been that since Kennedy cut it to that in 1965. There was some surcharges in the 60s, but went, went from 70 first to 50, January 1st, 1982, and then went to 28 in 1988. So the top rate had been 70 and went to 28 at the personal income tax. And there were cuts beneath that rate as well. Uh, so no, no rate was higher than 28. No rate had been higher than 70 in 1980. On the corporate side, the top corporate rate was 48% in 1978. And it was cut by 1987 to 34%. So the corporate rate went from 48 to 34%. Capital gains rate had been an effect of 49% in 1978, care of the statutory capital gains rate and the alternative minimum tax and it was cut in 1982 to 20%. So it went from 49 to 20. So you go from 70 to 28, personal side, 48 to 34 on the corporate side, and 49 to 20 on the capital gains side. Now, all I have done is just reverse those numbers. I've just gone 100 minus each one of those numbers, and that's what's called the return rate. That is, how much money for each marginal dollar is the earner keeping because of these tax rates. Under a 70% tax rate, an earner keeps 30 cents. There's the 30. Uh, that was the tax rate in 1980. Uh, under a 48% tax rate, a corporation keeps 52 cents on the marginal dollar. And on a 49% capital gains rate, such as in 1978, a, a person keeps 51 cents. Here's how all, all that changed. An individual, high-earning individual, kept 72 cents as opposed to 30 cents in the 1980s. That's a 140% increase. And the, that's an extremely powerful uh, income effect. There's a, it increases the demand for high income if the return rate to income increases by 140%. Same thing with the corporate rate. It's muted, of course. It's, it goes up by 27%, the rate to keeping corporate income after, the ta after taxes are paid. 
and capital gains income uh, after taxes goes up 57 percent. So the return rate goes up 57 percent. But what I'd like to focus on is that very powerful 140 percent rate. So the return to earning high income went up 140 percent because of the Reagan tax rate cuts. Well, what I am proposing, just simply kind of mathematically, is if that happens, you all of a sudden, as an employer, have to pay your highest earning people much more in cash. If you have a bunch of high earners, your executives, your top scientists, this is the era of the research labs, your top performers, and they're right now paying, say, at the 50% tax rate or something like that, or maybe higher, there's a split on, on earned and unearned income at that time, um, and all of a sudden their tax rate goes down to 28%, they're going to say, I want more money in salary because I get to take it home. Now, the amount of compensation that was non-salary at this point at the high end is truly incalculable. Um, vested pensions that were paid, paid zero, that were untaxable at lump sum, deferred compensation, which you got after severance and therefore when you were in a lower tax bracket, corporate recreation facilities, uh, college scholarships, uh, uh, corporate jets, the number of perks and perquisites that were functioned as high-end compensation that were deductible to the corporation, that were tax-free to the individual employee, is incalculable in the 1950s and the 1950s, 60s. So a, the lion's share almost of, of high-end compensation in the 50s and 60s was in kind. And it was deductible to the corporation at the corporate rate, 52 percent, and it was untaxable largely to the individual. That all changes in the 1980s. The 1980s, when all of a sudden the personal income tax rates go way down, all the top earners say, I want you to transform that income compensation, deferred pensions, all that stuff, into cash compensation. Instead of getting the in-kind, I want it in cash. Cash is the single most valuable item on the corporate balance sheet. So corporations are like, well, wait a minute, we bought all these capital assets, the recreation facilities and the corporate jets as your compensation. We have to expense those over a generation. I want cash now, the high earners said. And corporations either paid it, which they didn't have because it's the most valuable on the balance sheet, or they had to watch those people walk. The breakaway engineers, as the Wall Street Journal editor, Robert L. Bartley, called them in the 1980s. Well, when your best employees walk, by the Pareto power law, you lose uh, four times the efficiency of what you're paying them, because the Pareto power law says 20 percent of the people are doing 80 percent of the work. Well, if that corresponds to your compensation structure, if your highest paid people are indeed performing, uh, outperforming your standard employee by a, a factor of four, well, that means you're, that your profitability is going to be destroyed. You're losing the entire basis of your business model if you lose your top employees. So it's my thesis is that that's simply kind of, if you look at the mathematical ratios, that's what happened in the 1980s. That's why all these legacy firms laid off everyone early on. They lost their best people. They became the breakaway engineers that then were able to build up nest eggs. Under the high tax structure, 70% range, you can't build up a nest egg. So you can't build up in the 60s and 70s, if you're a high performer, something that will uh, tie you over outside of the corporate umbrella. You have to just always take the corporate payouts because so little of it is in cash. And so what happened is that these people left. It became impossible to do business for a legacy firm, so they had mass layoffs. But then these people who left, in, in turn, created the new businesses that then reorganized the assets and hired all the laid-off workers. And the net gain was 38 million new jobs between 1980 and 2000. So I think just kind of before you look at the archives and all that stuff, if you just look at the mathematical ratios of what Reagan did to the tax code, specifically with, rate, with respect to the return rates, you get kind of a mathematical necessity of what has to happen in American business. And you can see how this rocked the world of the American Fortune 500. I mean, they rolled in, the Fortune 500 rolled into the 1980s with business plans that were perfectly appropriate to the New Deal era tax code of high rates up to 48, 50 percent on the corporate side and, uh, you know, and, and 70 percent on the personal side. Then all of a sudden those tax rates flipped and all of business strategy was based on that tax system. And now it's like this. So you just had to have a 20-year period of discovery about how to organize a business in this new regime. I think that's the reason we saw the surge in management consultants, the surge in investment banking, and the surge in uh, corporate lawyering in the 1980s and 1990s, the famous yuppies of that time. All of a sudden, what was needed at scale was advice to business about how to flip their business pan plans to deal with the, uh, the low tax period. And I'm just going to make one other point. I want to talk about that bottom 
uh, graph so much as just to point out that tax rates used to begin above the tax take per GDP. So tax take per GDP used to be 17 percent, and somehow the income tax began at 20 percent. And the corporate rate was, you know, personal income and corporate income is national income. How can how can you have 17 percent of GDP when your taxes begin at 20 percent? So that just shows you how much tax avoidance there was in the 1950s and the 1960s. All business and personal plans were based on tax avoidance in the 1950s and 60s. In the 1980s, there, there was a close correspondence between the tax take as a percent of GDP and actual tax rates. It was 18 percent of GDP in tax take, and the personal rates went from 15 to 28. Oh, yeah, 18 is right in the middle. So there was a massive shift away from tax avoidance and towards paying rates at par at the statutory rate. And so that, that means that all the accountants were laid off and the entire strategy had to shift towards avoiding taxes, towards paying taxes. Um, and, you know, there's a wrenching, so all these things. And uh, the bottom line, though, is the, uh, the doubling, in, uh, the 95 percent increase in real economic growth over 20 years with uh, 40 million new jobs. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, our next speaker um, is Tony Bartle, um, and he's going to uh, present a paper titled Reagan's Rejection of Zombie Politics. So I look forward to hearing about uh, zombie Reaganism. Uh, Tony Bartle has a PhD in political science from Baylor University. He's a professor of political science at Angeles State University, where he is the pre-law advisor and teaches courses in American political thought, constitutional law, and Texas government, among, as I imagine, many other things, right? Uh, he is the author of The Principled Constitutionalism of Anthony Kennedy, uh, which was published in 2014, and he's the editor of Constitutionalism and Liberty Essays in Honor of David K. Nichols, which is under contract with Lexington Books. Tony. Yeah, I know how much uh, uh, Steve's looking forward to hearing all about zombie Reaganism today. <laughs> and we have it on good authority that... Uh, that the age of Reagan is definitely over, at least as of 2016, right? We heard that last night. Uh, so Donald Trump's uh, unorthodox campaign and his <laughs> unexpected electoral victory seem to signal the dissipation of Reagan's influence over Republican politics. It also revealed latent divisions among Republicans that have long been suppressed. Uh, one group of intellectuals on the right declared themselves against the dead consensus, rejecting the warmed over Reaganism of libertarian free market fundamentalism and neoconservatism for an adventurism. Also called uh, zombie Reaganism or undead politics, this political posture has been described as the application of a distorted version of the 1980s Republican politics to a very different time. This critique has two parts. First, what is often called Reaganism does not accurately capture the character of Reagan's political thought and practice. Second, Reagan's political program was a response to the problems of his time and is in many ways unsuited to the urgent problems America faces today. Reagan was a born Democrat and was a new dealer to the core by the fourth time he cast his ballot for Roosevelt. In the 1960s, however, he found himself reckoning with a similar death of the New Deal consensus. The moderate welfare state of Reagan's early life had given way to visions of a far more expansive use of government to shape the outcomes of social life. Kennedy's New Frontier and Johnson's Great Society both claimed FDR's Democratic Party and and the mantle of FDR's liberalism on behalf of their ambitious projects. If expanding the activity of government was the solution to the problems of FDR's day, they thought, further and rapid expansion was the solution of the, to the problems of their day. But Reagan rejected this reasoning, as he explains in his autobiography. Liberalism, he had thought, promised American citizens the same things as Thomas Jefferson had promised, freedom and self-reliance, that individuals be masters of their own destinies. But the newfangled liberalism rejected these beliefs. 
or the newfangled liberals. Quoting FDR, Reagan called an expansive welfare state a narcotic, which would destroy the human spirit, creating dependence on government and undermining freedom and self-reliance. This enervation of spirit is the present crisis President Reagan mentioned in his 1981 inaugural address. In this present crisis, he said, government is not the solution to the problem, government is the problem. He was not denying that government could be the solution to some problems, or that past crises might not have been due to a deficiency rather than an excess of government. And he had not turned against the moderate welfare state of the New Deal era. A year later, he wrote in his diary, the press is trying to paint me as trying to undo the New Deal. I remind them that I voted for FDR four times. I'm trying to do, undo the great society. It was LBJ's war on poverty that led to our present mess. Reagan, it seems, was not rejecting Roosevelt's so much as the zombie Rooseveltianism, <laughs> which we might say applied a distorted version of FDR's politics to the very different problems which arose well after the crises of Roosevelt's time had passed. So let us then consider Roosevelt's time and his New Deal, uh, the crisis of, New, of Roosevelt's time and his New Deal response to it. Democracy was at that time in retreat in the world and seemed to many unable to sustain itself. Totalitarian tyranny with its ambitions of global domination uh, was or seemed ascendant. Uh, <clears throat> would our political system and way of life, that is a democratic government that respected and protected the dignity and rights of individuals stand up to the pressures of the age? FDR's 1932 Commonwealth Club address argued that the consequence of closing the frontier and the Industrial Revolution was the steady accumulation of wealth and power in the hands of a few, putting the nation on a steady course toward economic oligarchy. This was a familiar part of the progressive era critique of American politics, but FDR's response to it was less radical than the progressives. Woodrow Wilson, as we all know, liked democracy. He did not like the US Constitution with its restraints on democratic government, such as individual rights uh, and separation of powers, which he thought were outdated. So he spent much of his career trying to figure, his career trying to figure out how to get around them. For all that, Wilson was considered the more conservative option than Teddy Roosevelt in the 1912 presidential election. TR and his capital P progressives pushed a series of constitutional amendments in the name of creating a pure democracy, which his old and dear friend Elihu Root said would change the whole constitutional basis of our government. Men like Root and Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., another old friend of TR's, banded together to back the supposedly reactionary William Howard Taft in order to prevent Roosevelt from gaining the nomination for the Republican Party and thereby implementing his plans. What has been little appreciated is that, no less than Roosevelt, all three of these men had previously been known uh, and considered themselves to be progressives, with a small p. Uh, they all backed the progressive legislative agenda of TR's first term, which empowered an active, one might say Hamiltonian, federal government to rein in the public harms related to urbanization, industrialized working conditions, and the great concentrations of economic power, among other things. But they broke from Teddy Roosevelt when his frustration with the pace of reform turned him directly against the Constitution itself, even more directly against the Constitution itself than Wilson was. Some cures, they insisted, were worse than the disease. They were neither radical individualists, that is, libertarians or small government absolutists, who opposed energetic government on principle, nor were they paternalistic 
enemies of individualism. As it turns out, they were conservatives. Primarily, this means constitutional conservatism, which takes shape as a response to the progressive assault on the Constitution. Getting back to FDR, the stated aims of the Commonwealth Club address and the general character of the argument may appear, at least on a superficial level, but maybe not only that, uh, they may appear closer to the conservative positions of the Republicans who opposed TR in 1912 than to the progressives. Throughout his long presidency, with its considerable innovations, FDR never attacked the Constitution, but was careful to explain that his program was consistent with and would, in fact, save the Constitution. Moreover, his criticism of individualism's excesses was balanced by a stated commitment to the core American tenets of individual liberty. What was needed, he said, was a reappraisal of values, not a replacement of them. The New Deal interfered to a degree with the property right through the regulation, regulation of private industry and the institution of a social safety net, but this interference with property rights was pursued in order to save the system of property rights from destruction. As one scholar of his statesmanship put it, Roosevelt understood that an essentially unregulated capitalism led to concentrated economic power, the nakedness and violence of the class struggle, and ultimately to socialism. Uh, Steve, that's Mort Frisch. I don't know if you knew him. <laughs> FDR had consciously nourished the expansion of, mi of the middle class, which constituted a stabilizing and moderating force in American life. And this nourishment had a powerful moderating effect on that portion of the society most susceptible to the attractions of a class orientation with its predictably factional, Marxists would say revolutionary, outcome. In doing so, the New Deal steered the nation between the scylla of placing property right, property at the mercy of the propertyless, and the charybdis of making freedom the preserve of the propertied, thereby reconciling both capital and labor to a system that pursued the common good of all. Finally, in strengthening the middle class, which is the true vital center of American politics, or of any republic, as Aristotle observed 2,500 years ago, FDR cushioned the nation against the factional strife that undermined faith in democratic government. And as Conrad Black has put it, he preserved the moral integrity of the country to be focused on the external threat posed by Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. That Reagan modeled himself rhetorically after FDR is well known. But many of my fellow conservatives believe their similarities end there. Reagan poured new wine, the new wine of Goldwaterite conservatism, into the old bottles of Rooseveltian rhetoric. I think someone said that in a paper yesterday. Um, as Henry Olson has written, the problem with these conservatives is not that they are ignorant. They just know so much that isn't so. Olson's recent book demonstrates that the deep sympathy with which Reagan treated FDR and the New Deal was not a rhetorical magic trick. Like FDR, Reagan thought that the government should serve the common people of this country, the men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes and heal us when we're sick, professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. In short, we the people, this breed called Americans. He did not divide the nation into makers and takers. Roosevelt's heroes were not the lonely individualists of an Ayn Rand novel. They were his fellow citizens, the boys of Pont du Hoc. Like Roosevelt, therefore, Reagan thought that government policy ought to be geared at expanding and promoting the middle class while softening the hard edges of the capitalist system. 
He believed that the freedom and dignity of people required that they not be weighed down by oppressive economic conditions. He insisted that broad-based prosperity was essential for maintaining the national integrity needed to fight against the communist threat. Reagan's vision of freedom was not that of the radical individualist, but had at its core a Jeffersonian or Tocquevillian vision of self-government that began with the family minding their own concerns, but ascended through stages of local, state, and federal governments, with each level being accountable to the people and serving its interests. As Olson shows, this set him apart from Goldwater and the libertarians who belittle <clears throat> uh, who belittle many of the basic tenets of representative government, such as, uh, such as the consent of the governed, mentioned in the Declaration of Independence, and who scoff at Reagan's and Roosevelt's care for the common man, believing instead that our concern should be for, in Goldwater's words, the initiative and ambition of uncommon men. Reagan was a New Deal conservative, Roosevelt concludes, I mean, Rosen conclude, concludes, who neither fetishized nor rejected government action, having little in common with zombie Reaganism. The real Reagan, Olson says, raised taxes when he thought it was appropriate, valued compromise over principal defeat, and eschewed direct military confrontation. If we are to agree with, agree with Rose. Olson that Reagan was a New Deal conservative, we must nevertheless account for the conservative element of the moniker. And to do so, we must consider Reagan's criticisms of FDR and the New Deal, as well as his praises, such as that FDR put in motion the forces that later sought to create big government and bring a form of veiled socialism to America. This was not an outcome that FDR himself had wanted, and so long as he remained in office, Reagan judged that FDR had been able to prevent it. But what FDR did not realize, Reagan said, was that once you create a bureaucracy, it is almost impossible to close down. During the Great Society, the accumulated effects of the increasing regulation of American life became oppressive to everyday Americans, especially as they moved on from narrow economic matters to social regulation more broadly. Uh, Reagan, Reagan uh, thought that the effect of the growth of the administrative state was, uh, was what was harming the middle class of his day and the people in general. Um, the greatest problem with it was not that it cost too much, that it was inefficient, or that it was incompetent, all of which were problems, but that it removed from the political process the great questions of public policy uh, that belonged to we the people and our elected representatives. Um, so uh, <clears throat> what, what Reagan's uh, criticism of FDR amounts to is is that uh, he, he, uh, he forgot that politics has limits uh, and, and that he, he put in motion uh, an essentially unlimited liberalism uh, pursuing unlimited ends. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and he forgot, he forgot that uh, in, Federalist 10, Madison warned that enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Um, uh, enlightened statements, statesmen like FDR himself. Um, so, uh, so Reagan ends up fundamentally disagreeing with FDR uh, on this important point. And this is the heart of his conservatism. Um, you can't have a merely uh, prudential politics. Uh, you have to have a constitutional politics. Um, and, um, well, I could say more, but I'm out of time. <laughs>
Thank you, Tony. Um, our next speaker is uh, Larry Bumgardner, and uh, his uh, paper is titled Defeating Evil Empires. Um, Larry Bumgardner is an Emeritus Associate Professor of Business Law at Pepperdine University. Before joining the business school faculty, he was an Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Washington, D.C. Internship Program at Pepperdine's Undergraduate College. He also held several administrative positions at the university and taught courses at its law school and public policy school. Previously, he served as executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation here in Simi Valley. Uh, he began his career as a journalist in Tennessee, where he graduated from David Lipscomb College and Vanderbilt University School of Law. Let's welcome Larry. I've got a difficult job here because I'm the presentation standing between you and lunchtime. Uh, so I'll do my best to keep this brief. It probably wasn't apparent from the title of my paper, but it continues the theme of comparing Ronald Reagan and Franklin Roosevelt. And so it's fitting that we are meeting here in the Roosevelt Room at the Reagan Library. And you may have noticed with FDR's portrait back there looking over your shoulders. Uh, with apologies to all those other presidents lined up around here, I think most of us would agree that Reagan and Roosevelt were the two most consequential presidents of the 20th century. In fact, we're here discussing the age of Reagan. Maybe we should take that even further and consider whether the last two-thirds of the 20th century was the age of Roosevelt and Reagan. Now, uh, we, not at this conference, but most casual observers of politics today still think of Roosevelt and Reagan as polar opposites. Yet those casual observers would be wrong. As we've already heard, there are a number of similarities and parallels between these two political icons. While this panel is focused primarily on economic and social policies of Reagan and Roosevelt, my paper focuses instead on foreign policy and world conflict. As the de facto leader of the free world, Reagan and FDR each faced an evil empire. Of course, we all know Reagan's famous evil empire speech about the Soviet Union. But FDR also spoke of World War II in terms of good and evil, freedom and tyranny. A year before the U.S. entered the war, Roosevelt said, there are those of us who say that the Axis powers would never have any desire to attack the Western Hemisphere. Let us no longer blind ourselves to the undeniable fact that the evil forces which have crushed and undermined and corrupted so many others are already within our own gates. Of course, there were contrasts in their epic conflicts. World War II was far more deadly in human terms, more painful in human terms than the Cold War. The military effort then dwarfed anything before or after. On the other hand, one could argue that the risk to the world confronting Reagan was as demanding as what FDR had faced. By the 1980s, a nuclear-armed world simply could not afford another world war. Any such conflict could have meant the end of civilization as we know it, as Reagan himself feared. So how did both Roosevelt and Reagan lead the nation and ultimately the world in defeating their respective evil empires? Let's talk briefly about the parallels in their policies, diplomacy, rhetoric, and results. First, they both rebuilt the nation's defenses. Reagan's record of strengthening the U.S. military, even in peacetime, is well known. You don't need me to recount all of what Reagan did on that. So in our limited time for presentation today, I'm going to focus more on what FDR did. Of course, during World War II, FDR spearheaded a massive military buildup that was crucial to the Allied victory. He personally set production goals for planes, tanks, ships, and guns, challenging the nation to meet his ambitious targets. Less known is that Roosevelt had been a forceful proponent of a strong national defense, even in peacetime. He began that effort when he became Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1913, 
when he sought to enhance and modernize the nation's naval capabilities. And that naval buildup greatly accelerated after the nation entered World War I in 1917. Well, two decades later, President Roosevelt encountered a difficult political challenge in preparing the nation for World War II while also seeking an unprecedented third presidential term in 1940. He faced strong anti-war sentiment from many in Congress and the public. Isolationists and many Republicans labeled Roosevelt a warmonger as he clearly edged the nation toward helping the British even while the U.S. remained officially neutral. Shortly before the 1940 election, and without obtaining congressional approval, FDR agreed to send 50 older American destroyers to Britain in return for gaining the right to build military bases on British territory. The destroyer deal was well received by the public, but FDR biographer Gene Edward Smith concluded that it was, quote, probably in violation of the Constitution and certainly contrary to statute, close quote. Well, after his reelection, FDR further rallied the nation to aid Britain in his arsenal of democracy fireside chat. He said, we must have more ships, more guns, more planes, more of everything. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. And it was in that same address that he spoke of the evil forces of the Axis powers. FDR increased U.S. support for Great Britain with the Lend-Lease Bill, persuading Congress to approve lending tanks and military supplies to the British. After Germany attacked the Soviet Union, FDR used Lend-Lease to support Russia as well. Well, four decades later, Reagan was also labeled a warmonger by many of his political opponents. He endured strong criticism from liberal voices arguing for a nuclear freeze, especially while Reagan was seeking to deploy nuclear missiles in Western Europe to deter the Soviet threat. In that 1983 Evil Empire speech, Reagan also said, The truth is that a freeze now would be a very dangerous fraud, for that is merely the illusion of peace. The reality is that we must find peace through strength. Despite his hawkish reputation, Reagan actually chose his real battles cautiously. The only active war the U.S. military saw during the Reagan years was the very brief conflict in Grenada, an effort to thwart Soviet and Cuban influence there. Instead, Reagan attacked communism and tyranny indirectly, aiding other forces and causes in their resistance efforts, such as the rebels fighting Soviet aggression in Afghanistan or the Solidarity Movement in Poland, or by supporting the Contras in Nicaragua, which unfortunately evaded or ignored the law much as FDR's destroyer deal had done. Second, Reagan and FDR both worked to build the nation's confidence as well as the military. Both Reagan and Roosevelt were successful in boosting the nation's morale and in the process openly displayed their faith in God. FDR candidly warned the country that it faced difficult times and severe sacrifices, but he always assured Americans of ultimate victory. In his date which will live in infamy speech, the day after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt asserted, no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Interestingly, Ukraine President Zelensky quoted that Roosevelt assurance about absolute victory in his own address to Congress just last year, adding, the Ukrainian people will win too, absolutely. FDR's morale-building efforts continued throughout the war. One of his most memorable radio addresses came the night of the D-Day landings. Roosevelt asked the listening nation to join him in an overtly religious prayer. For nearly six minutes, FDR led the nation in prayer on behalf of the U.S. troops. Well, Reagan, also a man of deep faith, would later echo FDR's prayerful theme. 
For the 38th anniversary of D-Day in 1982, Reagan's weekly radio address quoted briefly from Roosevelt's prayer. Then on the 40th anniversary, Reagan went to the site of the Normandy invasion to honor those same troops that Roosevelt had prayed for. Speaking to surviving members of those boys of Point to Hawk, Reagan also spoke of faith in that powerful address. He said, something else helped the men of D-Day, their rock hard belief that providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here, that God was an ally in this great cause. Reagan's faith also played a role in his plan for the Strategic Defense Initiative. He dreaded an Armageddon as written of in the Bible, the site of the final battle between good and evil. His personal diaries show a surprising number of references to Armageddon. A nuclear war could be the modern day version of Armageddon. Reagan was determined to reduce, if not eliminate, that nuclear threat. And yes, they both confronted and opposed communism. In his political years, there was no doubt about Reagan's anti-communist stance. An interesting point is that Jimmy Roosevelt, FDR's oldest son, actually played a role in first making Reagan aware of communist influence in Hollywood in the 1940s. If you don't know that story, you may want to look at the whole paper or ask me about it later. But what was FDR's view on communism? Both in his era and even today, some diehard critics of Roosevelt have accused him of fostering the rise of socialism or collectivism, if not worse, in the US. But in fact, Roosevelt spoke out strongly and consistently against communism. During the 1936 presidential campaign, when Republicans tried to make communism an issue, FDR said, I repudiate the support of any advocate of communism or of any other alienism, which would by fair means or foul change our American democracy. Then in, in a 1938 fireside chat, Roosevelt linked communism and fascism saying, be it clearly understood, however, that when I use the word liberal, I mean the believer in progressive principles of democratic representative government and not the wild man who in effect leans in the direction of communism for that is just as dangerous as fascism. Now, understandably, once the Soviet Union became a US ally against Germany in 1941, FDR greatly toned down his rhetoric about communism. He did not want to undermine the alliance with the Soviet, Soviet Union. And both had important summit meetings with the Soviet Union's leader. FDR has been faulted for giving away Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe to Stalin at the Yalta summit two months before FDR's death. He may have had little choice practically as military realities and his desire to get Soviet help in the continuing war against Japan were crucial factors. Now, one, while one might criticize FDR for the outcome of his only two meetings with Stalin, it is also important to note that he kept the fragile wartime alliance alive which was necessary to ensure success in World War II. And FDR was concerned about Stalin's actions after Yalta, just didn't live long enough to deal with them even if he could have. Reagan was widely criticized from both left and right for his second meeting with Gorbachev, seemingly failed Reykjavik summit. Fortunately, Reagan lived to have two additional and more successful summits with the Soviet leader, achieving the INF Treaty. Finally, both were champions of freedom. Perhaps most significantly, Roosevelt and Reagan saw their respective world conflicts as more than military or strategic battles alone. Rather, World War II and the Cold War were part of a grand struggle for freedom worldwide. Both Reagan and FDR were determined to defeat tyranny and they rallied the US and the free world to aim not only for victory in hot or cold war, but for freedom in general.
<laughs> Ultimately, both Reagan and Roosevelt defeated the evil, evil empires that fomented and spread that tyranny. As a result, few presidents ever did as much to advance freedom and to defeat tyranny as did FDR and Reagan. Historian John Patrick Diggins placed Roosevelt and Reagan alongside Abraham Lincoln as the three great liberators in American history, adding that Reagan alone succeeded in liberating people from tyranny without going to war. After their deaths, their contributions to freedom were recognized internationally, especially by their closest allies. And in both cases, their closest ally had been the British Prime Minister. Winston Churchill eulogized FDR before the, F before the British Parliament. He said, for us, it remains only to say that in Franklin Roosevelt, there died the greatest American friend we have ever known and the greatest <clears throat> champion of freedom who has ever brought help and comfort from the new world to the old. Former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, in her eulogy of Reagan in 2004, had comparable praise for her ally. She said, with the lever of American patriotism, he lifted up the world. And so today the world, in Prague, in Budapest, in Warsaw and Sofia, in Bucharest, in Kiev, and in Moscow itself, the world mourns the passing of the great liberator and echoes his prayer. God bless America. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we've only got about 12 minutes. Um, I had questions arranged for each of you, but uh, I don't want to put myself in front of uh, the audience who sat here patiently. So um, I will just ask you one question and then I will turn it over to the audience. Um, after having listen to one another present uh, on both, you know, Roosevelt and Reagan. And after hearing one another's analysis, I just wonder, do you have any qualms with one another? Does anyone want to throw any punches, blows, uh, any criticisms? I'm trying to start a fight up here and liven it up, right? Any criticisms of one another? I'm impressed how coherent we ended up being. Okay, okay, that's good. <laughs> or did you all think that they, they, they were pretty much, were you all pretty much in agreement? I definitely think we're uh, in tune. <laughs> okay. I'm Sorry, sure there'd be a few little points we would disagree yeah. on, yeah. but I think the general consensus yeah. is in the same direction. Okay. I'm going to open it up now. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I had a question for uh, Brian Dimitrovich, or is it Dimitrovich? Um, the, I loved your presentation. I found the way you laid out the mathematical model coherent um, and seemingly self-evident. And so why is it that this has become a consensus among economic historians? Is it that this lack of sources you've mentioned is stopping people from commenting on this era period, and you're trying to make this intervention that if you look at this, we don't need the sources? Or is it simply that this is something you've discovered and it's radical and new? Go ahead, Brian. For a second. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think the dominance of the piketty sayas literature has not, not been helpful. Um, piketty and Sayas uh, dealt uh, with uh, tax avoidance in, in their entirety in a footnote, uh, saying their anecdotal evidence is that tax avoidance was less in the high tax era than it was in the low tax era. That, of course, is a contradiction in terms. So I think it's an enormous research opportunity. And I, I do know just generally being around the history of supply side economics for 15, 20 years, um, it is the great deficit in Reagan scholarship. So I think there's a, a wide open field. Thank you. Yeah. Steve. Yeah, I always have a question. Uh, Anthony, um, I'd love your talk. I, I'll just, with the caveat that I think Henry Olson is one of my oldest friends, I think he overstates the case a little bit. But there's a lot to it, and we have a lot of fun talking about it. This is a, I want to draw on what I think is an implication of your talk for the present moment. Uh, so, so by the way, I, I, my view is that the Commonwealth Club address is one of the four or five most significant presidential campaign addresses ever. It gets ignored by a lot of historians, like Gene Edward Smith thinks it's uninteresting. Mm -hmm. I debated him once about it. Uh, and notwithstanding the problems that you or I might discern in it, what you marked out here was is that Roosevelt saw, and I think you saw Reagan did the same way, that there was a way to find a common ground. There was a, an attempt, conscious attempt to reconcile conflicting interests in our society. And never mind all the critiques you can make of the political economy of the New Deal, as a social and political fact, it worked. 
right? Create this long slurred majority and the country held it. You say the same thing under Reagan. Okay, so today, nobody seems to be consciously trying to find that same sweet spot in American politics. Our two parties, their strategy is not to try and broaden their appeal the way Roosevelt and Reagan did, very consciously in the rhetoric. Instead, the strategy now for 20 years is we're going to win narrowly with our base and whoever else we can peel off, and then we're going to govern with narrow majorities passing our legislature through Congress. And, you know, it works, you know, in, in epicycles, but that obviously is not a formula for long term. So, uh, the point is, where do we go from here? Why does nobody see what, what you and me seems intuitive and important and significant? Everyone says we love Roosevelt if you're a Democrat, like Obama, we love Reagan if you're. But nobody really gets that, and I'm sort of really, it really worries me that nobody has that kind of ambition anymore. Yeah, well, it worries me too, and I, I don't know where we go from here except to say, well, look, look at these models, see what they were doing, which is the best and most important of what they're doing, which is a challenge because people get on their hobby horses about people, they did this or they did that, or you know whether they like them, they don't like what they do. Uh, but I think the key is the middle class. Uh, and you might say the, import, the importance of, of uh, ma maintaining that uh, vital center, not you know, in political ideological terms, but in social terms. Uh, the more we become uh, bifurcated, uh, socioeconomically, geograph geographically, politically, uh, the harder it's going to be because, because the parties are going to respond to that and, you know, you know try and stir up the anger of the ends because the ends have such weight. Um, I guess that, yeah, so... Stuck yeah, but I think you know. Yeah, I don't agree with everything Henry says, but but I think he's trying to find uh, that path. I mean, he's he's clearly not just trying to be an historian. He's a pundit, right? Uh, and um, I think Rubio's trying to do some good things. I think J.D. Vance uh, has got some good ideas, but none of them rise to Reagan's abilities. Yet, so <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I was hoping you would tell me. <laughs> I wish I. Knew. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, John. Yeah. Um, also, and second question for uh, for Anthony, and also to a certain yeah. extent, responding to Dr. Hayward's question to you. Yeah. Um, I was very excited as somebody who studies the early 20th century US, to hear a presentation on Reagan that was so focused on progressivism. Yeah. Uh, that was, I, just, I love that. Um, if I can quibble a little bit with your characterization of some of the progressives you discussed, sure. especially in the 1912 yeah. presidential election, um, it's hard for me to see any, uh, any of these three people, certainly not Taft, but not Wilson or even Roosevelt, Either as people who were, you know, who hated the Constitution or who wanted to junk the Constitution altogether to move to a, you know, total, total transformation of the American political system. Um, I mean, both Roosevelt and Wilson were profoundly influenced by Herbert Crowley, who is a major progressive public intellectual and whose entire political and intellectual project was to find some sort of a balance between Hamiltonianism, the strong state, centralized government, and he says this very explicitly, Jeffersonian limited constitutional democracy. So Herbert Crowley sounds, he sounds when he talks like he could be plausibly a constitutional conservative, although he was also a progressive. Um, so um, you've, to a certain extent, framed your presentation around this idea that there are, there have been these moments when government has departed from constitutional conservatism, and in those moments you have FDR, and then you have Reagan mm -hmm. sort of emerging as a champion of some sort of constitutional conservatism at a moment when excess looms or threatens. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not so sure that's true only insofar as this rhetorical device of framing yourself as the savior of the Constitution, of, you know, the, the commander of a great consensus. This has been a device that many different... Um, people of many different political points of view, including many progressives who pursue fairly radical political agendas, have invoked for themselves. Um, so I, 
like how substantive is this commitment to constitutional conservatism in the case of Roosevelt and and Reagan? And how different yeah, yeah. is it from okay. Wilson's? For um, well, I think in the end, Roosevelt's is questionable, and I, that's what I'm pointing to. Uh, you know, he he saw um, whether you want to say it was that is Franklin Roosevelt. Um, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, uh, he he saw that may, maybe it was politically un unpopular. The people like the Constitution, but maybe you know between him and the the uh, t the events of 1912, you know he was looking abroad and he saw 1917, 1919, and uh, Hitler wasn't in power yet. But you know the brown shirts and the communists were warring in the streets of Berlin. And uh, it gave him maybe a little bit more of an appreciation for uh, the virtues of constitutional stability. And, you know, may maybe the criticism of Wilson and TR is overdone. My main point is, um, you know, I don't want to say that, yeah, maybe, maybe it's wrong to say he hated the Constitution, but he certainly wanted to change a lot of it. He did not like uh, the... the um, impediments to democracy uh, in, in, in the Constitution. You know, maybe he thought it just got, got out of kilt uh, and he wanted to put it back. Um, um, but, but uh, you know, he, he, I mean, he's on record as saying that social contract theory is outdated and, you know, it's, it, was, it was there to restrain kings and aristocracies, not not democracy. We're demo we're Democrats now, so we don't have to worry about the abuse of power as much and that sort of thing. So, uh, but but in my paper, I'm mainly relying on what, say, people like Root and Henry Cabot Lodge thought. Uh, and so, you know, historians can debate the the justification of their opinions, but this is what they thought, and they acted on that thought. Awesome. We've got maybe one time for one more question, if it's very brief. If not, can we give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you so much for coming.